In today's 10 jaw-dropping 911 calls, a swatting prank with a deadly ending, a brave woman tracks down a bank robber, and an unsolved murder that will play on your mind for days to come. When emergency service dispatchers answer a call, they have three main things to do. Identify the emergency, find out where it is, and get that information to the relevant department. Often it's the caller themselves who needs help, but there are some occasions when those committing the crime dial 911. 911, what is the location of your emergency? Uh, dispatch this 582, standby. Are you still on the line? And are you still on the line? Okay, I just had a, a person call uh, down to the security desk at City Hall, and he said his mother had just, like, uh, hit his dad over the head with a handgun, okay? I have his phone number, but for some reason, either he is hanging up or I can't transfer it. So I'm going to give you the phone number. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'll go ahead. Okay. Call him back. All right, bye. Bye. Hello? This is 911. What's going on? Hello? Yeah. This is 911. What's going on? Um, I recently got disconnected. I had told you guys everything that happened. I had the argument with my mom and dad. Okay. What's your address? Hello? Yeah, um, it's 1033 West McCormick Street. Okay, tell me exactly what happened. They were arguing and I shot him in the head and he's not breathing anymore. Okay, so what's going on right now? Are you there? Yeah. Okay, do you have any weapons on you? Yeah, I do. What kind of weapons do you have? Um, a handgun. What kind of handgun is it? I don't know, it's my dad. What color is it? It's black. Where exactly are you at in the house? Um, by the closet. Okay, what closet? My mom's. Where's that at in the house? Uh, in her room, which is where she's at, and my little brother. You have a little brother? Yeah. I was on the phone with you guys earlier, um, telling you guys about it. I just I got disconnected. Okay. Well, we're going to try to get you some help. Um, we're exactly in the house. Like, is this a one-story or two-story house? It's one story. Is it towards the front of the house, the back of the house? Um, well, like, it's, it's like, towards the back, I guess. I'm just pointing the gun at them, making sure they stay in the closet, my mom and my little brother. Okay, is there any way you can put the gun up? No. Are you guys sending someone over here? Because then I'm definitely not going to put it away. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and stay on the phone with you, okay? That's fine. Until I get here, or? As long as you need me to, okay? Yeah, I'm thinking about, um, because I already poured gasoline all over the house. I might just set it on fire. Okay, well, we don't need to do that, okay? In a little bit, I might. Why would you do that? Do you have my address correct? Can you verify it for me again? Um, it's 1033 West McCormick Street. Um, my zip code is 67213. Okay. So, which way does your house face? Like, does your front door face north, south, east, west? I don't know. It's just facing the street. My dad isn't breathing. It's kind of giving me anxiety, making me, like, paranoid. Hello? I'm still here. I'm still here, okay? Yeah, me too. Okay, are you white, black, Asian, Hispanic? Are you there? Yeah. Are you white, black, Asian, Hispanic? Is is it was an accident, so Okay, that's fine. 
Nothing in the 911 call you just heard was true. The call was made as part of the dangerous prank known as swatting. When someone falsely reports an incident to get the SWAT team to go to someone's address. But on December 28, 2017, Wichita police in Kansas had no way of knowing the call was a bad joke and responded immediately. 28-year-old father of two, Andrew Finch, opened his front door and was shot and killed by the police who had responded to the prank call. Upon noticing police lights flashing outside his house, Andrew Finch came out of his house to see what was going on and was met with Wichita Police Department officers who had their weapons pointed at him. As ordered, Andrew began to put his hands up, but he paused. Officer Justin Rapp, who was on the other side of the street, fired a single shot which hit Andrew in the chest, piercing his heart and right lung. Andrew Finch was an innocent victim of swatting, which had all been because of a $1.50 wager on an online game which two men lost. The men had no connection to Andrew Finch. Casey Viner, who used the name Vaporizer, and Shane Gaskill, who used the pseudonym Miracle, got into an argument about friendly fire while playing Call of Duty World War II. Casey Viner took to Twitter and threatened to swat Shane Gaskill. Gaskill said he'd be waiting and gave Casey Viner the address of a house that he and his family had been evicted from the previous year. Casey Viner then contacted a homeless man named Tyler Barris and passed on the address to SWAT who he thought was his gaming opponent. Tyler Barris had a criminal record and had served 16 months in LA County Jail for making false bomb threats against the TV station, an elementary school, and a middle school. He was also wanted in Florida for making approximately 30 other bomb threats and in Canada for harassing a woman. Tyler Barris called the Wichita Police Department, told them he was holding his family at gunpoint, and unknowingly gave them Andrew Finch's address. He checked if police were on the way and threatened to set the house on fire. Police responded immediately. Andrew's mother heard her son cry out before the officer discharged his weapon. A police statement said that the officer had fired because he thought Andrew was reaching into his waistband. Andrew Finch was taken to St. Francis Hospital and was pronounced dead just 17 minutes after he had been shot. He was unarmed. Andrew's mother, along with other family members who were in the house, were handcuffed and taken to the police station for questioning. Belongings, which included a computer and two phones, were taken from the house. A week after the shooting, Andrew's body still hadn't been released to his family. An attorney for the family called for the police department and the officer that killed Andrew to be held liable for what he called the unjustified shooting of Andrew Finch. Casey Vino was just 18 years old and lived in Ohio. He was sentenced to two years community service and one year and three months in prison. Shane Gasco was a year older and from Wichita. He was sentenced to two years probation. For making the hoax call, along with 46 additional charges, Tyler Barris, who was 25 from Los Angeles, was sentenced to 20 years in federal prison after he pled guilty and agreed to a plea agreement. The police officer, Justin Rapp, later testified that he had only seen Andrew Finch make a motion with his hand and was not charged with any crime. In 2019, Andrew Finch's family filed a lawsuit seeking $25 million in damages from the city of Wichita. Twenty-two-year-old Florida student Timothy Englehart died on September 13, 2014. The victim's friend contacted 911 and told them that he shot himself, but the truth of that fateful night is still unknown. Oh my God! 911, where's your emergency? Yeah. Okay, we have an ambulance. My friend shot himself. I think he said he shot himself. Try to try to stay calm, okay? You said Holly Hill, Florida. Okay. He shot himself? Yes. Where's the gun? It's in the room where he killed himself in our front room. Oh my gosh. Relax, Jake. I'm calling 911. Relax. You sit down. Okay. Sit down. Man, you calm down, okay? How many yes. people are there? There are four of us and then the, our friend who shot himself. Okay, try to calm down. What's your name? My name is. What's your phone number in case I lose you? Um, my phone is in the front room and I kind of want to go there. This phone, the number is area code, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, area code. 
Okay, we've got help on the way, and you guys just okay. okay. Don't, Jay, sit don't, down. I don't. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm kidding. I don't want you to touch the weapon. Okay. Okay, we're not. We're not. Is it? Jake, is relax. It stand still. Yes, it is. It is. He's on the front porch. Ambulance is coming. Relax. Okay. The last time you looked at him, ma'am, do you think that he he had passed away? I think he did. He was so sad and he fell over. <sighs> it didn't look like he was moving at all or breathing or his chest wasn't moving. No. So, relax. Just sit down. The friend belongs to my boyfriend here, and he's he's very upset because he feels responsible for it. Relax, relax, calm down, relax. Relax, relax, relax. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Everybody as calm as you can, okay? Can you guys go outside for me? We are outside. We're in the backyard. Jake, sit down, relax, sit down, sit down, relax. Relax, sit down. Relax, Jake. Sit. Sit down. Just sit down. Sit down. Relax. 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 Sit down. Relax. Relax. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. You need to sit now. Please. Relax. 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 Jake, relax. I want you to sit here with me. Please relax. Please. Is there a gate they, they can come through to get to you guys in the backyard? Yes, we have our neighbor here who's who's helping us stay calm. We hear the sirens are coming. Jake, Jake, please calm down. Please sit. Jake, sit. sit. He's like gone. Jake, Sir, sit down. Relax. Take a deep breath, okay? Oh, I'm on the phone still, but Jake, relax. I need you to relax, please. Please relax. Please relax. Please relax. Please calm down. Does Jake own the gun, ma'am? Yes, it is okay. his gun. He They're is pulling registered up to now. Him. They're pulling up now, okay? So nobody. I didn't you know. kill him. No, you didn't. Relax. You didn't kill him. Relax. He... Oh, my God. I can't believe he did that. Okay. They they can't rule it a suicide until they check out the scene. Oh, my God. Okay, I understand. They come in there with a gun drawn, okay? Okay. Um, Jake, relax. You're going to. She said they're going to come with, a gun, with their guns drawn, okay? They may, relax. they may, so don't, don't they freak might. out, okay? So don't freak out. Just relax. Lay down and relax. I'm here with you. We're all here. I I was there with you, and it, it, it stayed with him. He's trying to take it away from him. Oh, my God. I can't believe that just happened. It's surreal. I'm not sure that just happened. Jake, relax. Relax. What's he doing before he, he pulled the gun on himself? He was stressed. We tried to tell him that, you know, talking through the stresses that he had. He was very stressed about everything. <laughs> we didn't think the gun was loaded. We didn't think he was serious. He wanted to hold the gun. Uh huh. We didn't think he was going to do that. Do you think it was an accident, or do you think it was on purpose? I very much think it was an accident. I think that he was just not thinking that, that we, none of us realized there was a gun in the chamber. There's a round in the chamber. And, okay, yes, sir. I'll okay. let you go, okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Goodbye. The aspiring meteorologist was having a BBQ with friends at a rented house in Daytona Beach. On the eve of his death, he allegedly made suicidal remarks after making a phone call and later went to a friend's home in Holly Hills to feed their dogs. This is when he reportedly put the gun to his head and tried to pull the trigger. The gun's magazine had been removed, but there was still a bullet in the chamber. Four others had purportedly been at the home when the incident occurred, including Jacob Eldred, Charles Eichler, and Rachel Schlossberg, who reportedly tried to stop his friend from killing himself, but in his attempts to take the gun from Englehart when he accidentally pulled the trigger. Engelhart, who was due to graduate the following year, suffered a single gunshot wound to the head. Police reports made by witnesses of Engelhart's death contradict one another, but one states clearly that the victim had grabbed the gun and pointed it towards his head. Eldred attempted to stop him, his finger accidentally pulling the trigger. At the same time, another account by witness Stephanie Lauber, who was also there, says that the victim had seen the magazine being removed from the gun. She witnessed him place the gun to his head and pull the trigger, collapsing to the floor. 
Lauber continued her account by telling police that she believed it was an accident and that the victim did not think there was actually a bullet in the chamber. In contrast, Bill Engelhart, the victim's father, has disputed the accounts by Eldred and his friends. He claims that his son had not been suicidal. He said that the police report compiled was full of lies, making exceptional reference to the fact that the victim had called home shortly before his death. Phone records proved that there had been no call made to either parent. Police investigations revealed that the gun was found in another room away from the body. According to Eldred, who admitted to holding the gun when it went off, claimed that he had placed it on the coffee table in the other room after the incident occurred. The 26-year-old was charged with a misdemeanor three months later and all additional charges were dropped. The victim's parents were outraged by this, stating that they believed the truth of what happened that night was covered up by the four people who had been in the home. Bill noted in an interview that they had been waited three months for this report and it's a whitewash. His grandmother had just told Tim that she would pay for his flight ticket home. He was happy. Why would he take his own life? We want answers. Almost 10 years later in 2021, Bill and Therese Engelhart are still demanding answers, wanting justice and the real truth about their son's death. New Year's Eve, a night that is usually filled with joy, beers, and the welcoming of the new year, turned into a horror for the Serqua family after a squabble over the past caused Robert Serqua to murder his twin brother in the kitchen. Getting into a heavily drunken argument in the early hours of New Year's Eve in 2014, Robert brutally stabbed Christopher to death with a kitchen knife. The twin brothers were back at the family home in Hythe, Hampshire, 
and had been sharing a bedroom after both of their long-term relationships broke down. According to Robert's confession, the siblings often fought when drinking. He also claimed that his brother Christopher had been addicted to strong cannabis, which bothered Robert immensely. The killer said Christopher's personality had changed severely since becoming addicted to skunk, smoking up around 80 pounds worth every day. The two had been drinking beers together and reminiscing about the past on the eve of the killing, December 31st, 2013, when Robert had sent his new partner a text saying they were talking about the past and had things to sort out. The argument escalated when Christopher demanded one of Robert's beers and he refused. According to Robert, who told the jury in court, when I looked up, he turned around with a kitchen knife in his hand. He was glaring at me. I thought, I've got to get the knife. My memory is a bit hazy, but we scuffled. He then reportedly heard his brother yelp, saying, I looked down and I had the knife in my hand. He said he didn't see any blood, but realized that he had caught him. He had stabbed his twin once in the stomach with a knife. Once inseparable as children, the sobbing Kilder told the courtroom of his love for his brother. They both went into the building trade, Robert as a bricklayer and plasterer, Christopher as a carpenter, and often worked on jobs together. Their parents had been upstairs at the time of the stabbing. The brother's mother, Denise, hurried to call 999 while Peter, their father, tried to save Christopher. In his drunken state, Robert panicked and ran out of the house without even stopping to put on shoes and attended a party with the woman he had been texting. Police arrested Robert in the early hours of New Year's Day. They told him that his brother was dead. Later during an interview with police, Robert said, I killed my effing brother. Nine out of 10 times he would be all right. Just my luck he had to die on me. During his sentencing in October that same year, it came to light that Robert had served previous prison sentences for offenses of battery and affray in connection to domestic incidents involving his former romantic partners. Additionally, he had previous convictions for motoring offenses and other criminal charges. He claimed self-defense, but a jury found him guilty of murder, and Robert Serqua was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 13 years. In July 2008, Michael Roseboro, a man with many secrets, called 911 after finding his wife and mother of four children, Jan Roseboro, in the deep end of their swimming pool. He was arrested and charged with her murder. Lancaster County 911. Uh, everyone wipes this I'm sorry? Everyone wipes this drowned. Okay. And, and what happened? I had gone to bed about an hour and a half ago, and she was outside, and, and I came out, and I saw the lights were still on the pool, the, the, oh God, the board, the board was still on, and I came out, and I, I found her in, in the deep end of the pool. Okay. Is she breathing? No, she's not. Is she still in the water? No, I pulled her out. Okay, do you want to try to start CPR on her? I will, I will, yeah. Okay, do you need help to do that? I can give you instructions on what to do. I, 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 I would like to you. I, I know. Well, I, I, I can walk you through it if you want help. That's because I, I want to get her out of the pool. What's that? I want to get her out of the pool. You, uh, she's still in the pool? I, yeah, I, I thought you said she was out of the pool. No, I, oh my God, she's, I'm sorry, she's out of the pool. I, yeah, uh, help me through it, please. Okay, you, so she is out of the pool? Yes. Okay, what I want you to do, is there anybody else there? My, my children are asleep. How old are your children? 12, 9, and 6. Okay, what we need to do is get her on her back. Yes, sir. Okay, you have her flipped over onto her back? On her back, yes. Okay, I want you to check and see if she has a pulse. Do you know how to do that? I do. Okay. There's, there's no pulse. There is none? There is none. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to start the, uh, the CPR, okay? Okay. Keep her head tilted back, pinch her nose closed, cover her mouth with yours, and give her two deep, regular breaths, about one second each. Okay. Is that the, the siren for the fire department there? Yeah. Okay. Well, hold on. I can throw up. Please hold on. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. Is there somebody there? Not yet, no. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to start the compressions, okay? Go ahead and put your hand on her chest. I want you to pump her chest hard and fast about 30 times, about twice a second. Okay. Okay, but the chest come up all the way between pumps. And let me know when you've done it 30 times, okay? Okay. All right, go ahead and do that. All right. <laughs> 
Okay. You did it about 30 times? Okay. Go ahead and look in. I want you to look in her mouth and see if there's anything in there. Okay. The ambulance is here, sir. The ambulance is there? Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Go get them, okay? Thank you. All right. Lancaster County is home to the quiet town of Denver, which was shaken by the news of Jan Roseborough's gruesome death in 2008. Michael had reported to police that he believed that an intruder had killed his wife, claiming that $40,000 worth of jewelry had gone missing that same day. According to authorities, the death was first assumed to be an accident. However, after the autopsy revealed that Jan was also beaten and strangled, Police began to suspect that her husband, who was the local funeral home director in the little town, had been involved with her death. Police began to investigate and discovered that Michael had led a string of affairs, and his most recent was Angela Funk, who had become pregnant with his child. The woman had reportedly been angered and outraged upon finding out that she was one of many women with whom her lover had been unfaithful. Funk had described Michael as a man who made me feel like a woman, a beautiful woman, but was also hurt and distraught at the knowledge that he might have murdered his wife to be with her. She said that he did not love her if he was willing to kill his wife for her, adding that all she felt was used. In September 2009, Judge James Cullen sentenced 42-year-old Michael Roseborough to life in prison without parole for the first-degree murder of his wife, Jan. Michael Roseborough became the focus of a 48 Hours Mystery Special on CBS, which tells the tale of Michael and his affairs with various women, depicting him as a selfish and cold-hearted killer. The one-hour special aired on the night of his 43rd birthday. A 911 call made by a 27-year-old led to a three-hour standoff with the local SWAT team. In December 2015, Fegaya Tausaga Leatua used his three-year-old daughter as a hostage. The Thurston County Sheriff's SWAT team was called to his home after stabbing the 911 caller multiple times. 911, what are you reporting? Yeah, I'm reporting a stabbing in my house. What's the address? 8406 49th Loop Southeast. And it's a house, not an apartment? It's a house. Okay, where was the person stabbed? Uh, he's a, multiple stabs in the leg, in the head, everywhere. I need an ambulance here now. Stabbed now. in the head and the, le and the leg? Yes, yes. I got, um... My is the patient conscious? He, right now he is, but my wife's nephew's here and he stabbed him. Okay, where is he now? He's still in the house. I need, I need a police here, too. Okay, anyway. while we're talking, my partners are advising law enforcement and fire department, okay? So talking to me won't slow them down. Does he still have the knife? Yeah. Oh, where, where is he at? Come on. I'm still here. Stay here, please come. They're coming. He's still in the room. My wife's trying to talk him out of it. Put it down, E5. So he still has the weapon? I'm set you up. He still has the weapon? What? Who put you online, you fuck? What game? Five. Stop. 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 Please. Please come now, please. Okay, we've got some advice. I just want to try to get more info. You stay on the line with me, okay? Stay on the line with me. Does somebody have any... Can somebody put pressure on the wound? Yeah. Somebody get clean dry cloth and put pressure on the victim's wounds, okay? Okay. Where is your nephew? He's in the bathroom right now. There's blood everywhere. My God. Your nephew is the one that stabbed him, right? Yeah, he's my wife's nephew. Put pressure on you. Okay. And who is the patient? Is it a male or female? He's a male. He's oh, how old is he? He's who? How old is who? The patient. He's 27. Okay, and is he still conscious while we've been talking? 
Yeah, he's, he's sitting on the floor now. His blood is everywhere. he breathing okay? Yes, he's breathing. He's okay. Okay, okay. And again, okay. sir, I, I understand you're upset. I, I understand, but talking to me won't slow them down. I'm just getting them more information, no, okay? No. While they're while yeah, they're already advised, okay? Wife, but my wife is trying What's to talk your to wife's nephew? The room with What's, a knife, okay? I understand that. I'm crazy. Can everybody else get safely to another room? I just want to keep everybody safe. Yeah, I understand. Okay. I understand. Damn. Are they coming? Are they yes, they coming? were. Yes, they were advised when you first called. Okay. Oh, do you know your wife's nephew's name? Um, Nephi. How do you spell that? N E P H I. P like Paul H like Henry I. Yes, N E P H I. You stay upstairs. Okay. Do you know Nephi's last name? No. Okay. How old is he? He's 28, something like that. Is he white, black, Hispanic, Asian? He's Islander. Pacific Islander? Cameron's coming. Yeah, he's Islander. Okay. All right. And he's still in the bathroom while we've been on the line? Is he locked in there? No, my son's in the bathroom bleeding, and, and my wife got him... The other guy in the room. Trying to okay, so your son was the one that was stabbed. Okay, which room yeah. is for the suspect in? He's downstairs in the room. It's hard to explain. Just downstairs in the room. That's just so he's in a bedroom downstairs. Is he by himself in that room? No, my wife is by the door trying to talk to him to get the knife out of his hand. Okay, so he's in a downstairs bathroom, bedroom and your wife's outside the door. Yeah, and he's talking to him and he's... I don't know. He's like going crazy or something. He keeps thinking people are. Is he? He's yeah, having. Him, is he under the? In, okay, it's just driving time. I know it seems like a long time, but we have to get them. You know, they have to come from wherever they were at. Okay, just stay on the line with me while we wait. Okay. Oh, damn. Oh, shit. So is he under the influence of anything? Who him? I don't know what the hell he's on. He's on some bullshit. But he's having I some mental issues. Yes. Yes. Okay. Any other weapons in the house besides the knife? No, no. So no firearms are in the house? Come on, please hurry up for my son, please. Okay, I, I understand, sir, but again, talking to me doesn't slow them down at all. They they uh, they are going to go as fast as they can. They were advised when you first gave me the address, okay? Well, Just bear with me, okay? Try to be patient with me. I know... I know you're upset. I understand. Put the phone up to you, Okay. Are you and you're with your son in the bathroom? In the bathroom is that yeah. upstairs? Yeah, last week on his left leg, his right horn, and his head on the right side. And he right side of head. Two lacerations. Two lacerations on his right arm. One on his left leg, and the right side of his head. Is he still alert? He's barely. He's, he's man. A lot of blood came off. Okay. And if we can just keep keep keeping pressure on that, and so you're come on, guys. Where's the police? Fuck. I'm gonna keep you on the line until they get inside, sir. Okay. God damn it. There's blood all over the place. Okay, and if anybody's able to just keep pressure on his wounds, I know he's got a lot of wounds there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Keeping pressure. Okay, man. I got you, bud. Got you, man. You put pressure here. Full pressure. Hold it up, all right? Does his breathing still seem normal? Yeah. Let me see this right here. Oh, my God. He had a deep laceration in his head. That's pretty deep. Yes. He has a knife. Okay. Can you describe the knife? Do you know how big it is and what type of knife it is? Is that the police? Hey, if you're hey, able. Come in. Are they at your door, sir? Yeah, there's police right there. Okay, I'll let you talk to the deputy, okay? He's in the, in the, the bottom back. According to authorities, the 30 year old tattoo artist known as Nephi was shot in the head and killed after a three-hour standoff at the house south of Long Lake near Lacey. SWAT was reportedly sent to the home after receiving a 911 call from his 27-year-old cousin, who had frantically told emergency services that he had been stabbed several times by Leotua. 
Lea Tao's cousin, who had been living with Lea Tao and his daughter since the previous October, was taken to Harborview Medical Center and was confirmed to be in a stable condition by Lieutenant Cliff Zeismer of the Thurston County Sheriff's Office. When SWAT arrived at the home on 49th Loop, Lea Tao retaliated by retreating to a bedroom in the house and used his daughter as a shield, threatening to slit her throat. After a three-hour standoff, a SWAT marksman was able to shoot Lea Tao once in the head, and he was pronounced dead on the scene. Police say that Lea Tao was shot due to immediate concern for the daughter's safety. According to his Instagram page, Lea Tao was initially from Samoa. He was a renowned Polynesian tattoo artist and moved from Florida the previous October. He met Suzanne Shepard, co-owner of Primeval Inc. Tattoo in Olympia, when he walked into the shop with his portfolio. Shepard described his work as the most incredible thing she had ever seen. Shepard said he had worked for her through most of November, but stopped showing up to work when something just turned his life upside down. Shepard expressed her shock from learning of his death. He was just the sweetest soul, Shepard had said. He would have never harmed that child for the world. He talked about her all the time. The three-year-old was placed into the custody of her mother. A criminal's plans to rob a bank in Mount Vernon were foiled when a woman who was once a felon helped police track down and apprehend an alleged bank robber in March 2021. 911, what is the address of the emergency? Um, the CES bank just got robbed. I am following the guy right now. I'm following the guy. He's in a um, jail. He's... Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. He's in a he's in a yellow shirt. He's walking right down Chestnut Street. Okay, which CES bank? The CES. He just took off his yellow shirt. He is now in a um. He is now in a blue shirt. He just went left. He's right here by the moose. Um. He's right here by the moose. He's right here by the moose. He's taking off his shirt. He's um right here behind Little Caesars, in between the moose and Little Caesars. Hurry, hurry, hurry. He's got a gun. He's got a gun. He's got a gun, sir. He's got a gun, sir. I hear you. I hear you. He's right here. I I I got my eyes on him. Right now. Where's the police at? The CES. Where's the police? He's right here. He's right here. He's in Little Caesars. He's trying to go into Little Caesars. He's trying to go into Little Caesars. He's trying to go into Little Caesars, sir. I hear you. Okay, now he's walking over to KFC. Okay, he's trying to go over to KFC. And you did say he does have a gun? Yes, yes, I see the police. He's right here in this parking lot. He's right here in this parking lot. He's trying to throw his stuff over into the, uh, he, he tried to throw his stuff right. I'm trying to keep an eye on him. If the police would come on. Yes, yes, I see the police. 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 Jane Doe had once been a bit of a criminal herself being incarcerated a total of seven times before moving back to her hometown and turning her life around, getting married and having five children. But being on the flip side of this equation before, not as a bank robber, but a criminal mind, she knew something was wrong as soon as the man later identified as Jared L. Shaw walked into the CES credit union where he had gone to make a withdrawal. She noted that he was wearing a hat, something that is not allowed at the bank, Doe reportedly saw the man showing the bank teller his gun, telling her to give him everything. She hastily grabbed her money that she had withdrawn and ran to her car. According to Doe, she had tried to dial 911 when Shaw followed her, carrying his bag of stolen money and attempted to smash her windscreen with his gun. But the window did not break. He made a break for it, but Doe was hot on his trail, following him as he tried to run away. She got a hold of 911 and told him what was happening as she tailed the thief. Shaw had fled to an alley behind Colonial City Moose Lodge. He reportedly began removing his distinctive yellow shirt as well as his hat and mask. 
She followed him onto High Street, where he cut through the KFC parking lot, where he withdrew his gun. Doe had gotten out of her car and was following from a distance when police approached the suspect with their weapons drawn, and he was apprehended without struggle. Jared L. Shaw, age 39, was booked into Knox County Jail on one count of aggravated robbery. There is no information available to what verdict was reached, but his charge was a first degree felony, and when booked into jail, Shaw faced up to 16 and a half years behind bars. It was July 5th, 2015, when a 911 call captured the last living moments of Andrew Loku, who was shot fatally by police only 19 seconds after he was ordered to drop the hammer he was clutching in his hands. open the door. Okay, but somebody's trying to get into the apartment? Yeah, he came inside with a hammer. Okay, so what's going on? So what's going on now? Um, he's standing at the door talking. He said he's going to kill my friend. And he tried to and he walked he literally walked inside the apartment. Okay. So where is he now? He's in the hallway in front of the door. And where's your friend? She's right here. Okay, why does he want to kill her? Because he keeps banging on the floor. So she went downstairs to knock on the door and he was opening the door and slamming it, opening the door and slamming it right really loud. And it's making the stuff fall down in the apartment. So she knocked downstairs. He came back up with a hammer and walked inside the apartment. What is wrong with him? Why are you asking your mom outside? Oh. Okay, so he's from the apartment upstairs? Okay. He's he, he holding the door so I cannot lock the door. And he lives below us. Okay, what, do you know his name? No, I don't. What apartment is he in? Um, this is i pretty sure because it's right below us. Okay, and she went down to tell him to stop making the noise? Pardon me? What is he saying? Um, he's going to kill. He's going to kill my friend. And who's that talking? Um, my friend's mom. Right, so what is, what's everybody saying there? What's going on? Um, I'm not seeing now. The door's closed. I'm not sure what's happening. Who's outside in the hall? The, the man. Just the man is there? He's yelling. Friend. Yeah, he's yelling. I'm on the phone with the police right now. So he's banging stuff in the hallway. Okay, what does he look like? Is he white, he's black, African. Asian? He's African. He's screaming in the hallway. Okay, how tall is he? <laughs> how old do you think he is? Um, maybe four, in the 40s, 45. Okay, how tall he's, is he? He's, like 5'11". What was he wearing? He's, listen, he's breaking stuff in the hall. And gray. A gray jacket. Gray jacket? I'm pretty yeah. sure, yeah. And what? Um, I'm not sure what else. He's breaking everything in the hallway with a hammer. You know what's going I'm sorry for a time, because when I get mad, I cry. Okay, so where are you? Inside the apartment. Did you open up the front door? Who's that? Who's screaming right now? You're downstairs? Who's that screaming? It's the guy with the hammer. Yeah, but is there a woman screaming? Yeah. Who's the, who, one of the neighbors and him. So another neighbor's come out of their apartment? Pardon me? Has another neighbor come out of their apartment? Yes, yes. So where is he? In the hallway. He's still there? Yes. Why did they talk about talking? Yeah. Like, is it that like he wants to oh. Somebody's arguing. 
Hello? Hello, everybody's here. I'm right here. Okay. All right, I've seen that. Yeah, the police are there. Okay, okay, you open the door. What? Okay, how did they get in? I'm not sure. Nobody opened the door for them. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What was oh, that? There was gunshots. Oh, my God. Are you okay? Oh, my God. What was that? The gunshots from the police officer. <laughs> Are you okay? Okay, can you go in your apartment, please? Yes, no. Did you kill him? <laughs> oh my, what? Don't <laughs> <He's dead. He's laughs> Okay, can I get your name? What happened? Police come up the elevator? Um, no, there's only stairs, so I guess they came up the stairs and the, the guy wouldn't put down the hammer, so I was they shot him. The 45-year-old Sudanese refugee and victim of a racially fueled shooting arrived in Canada in 2004 and soon settled in Toronto. He had just completed a college degree and was hoping to bring his family to Canada. Loku reportedly fought for 16 years in the civil war in Sudan, where he was abducted, beaten, and tortured. According to family members, he still heard bullets in his sleep. They believed it was post-traumatic stress disorder that he was suffering from. In 2009, the Canadian Mental Health Association assisted with finding him a one-bedroom apartment in Toronto. The ex-soldier had constantly struggled to sleep due to the selfishly loud music coming from his neighbors. He and his neighbors had all allegedly struggled due to the noise. On the night of his fatal death, his response was to grab a hammer and bang the walls, the floor, anything he could to retaliate against the noise. He had gotten into an altercation with a neighbor surrounding her loud and noisy children when 911 had been contacted. The father of five was allegedly standing in the hallway outside of his neighbor's apartment holding the hammer in his hands when the father of five was fatally shot dead by Constable Andrew Doyle. There are several sides to the events that occurred in the moments between 911 being contacted and police arriving. According to Doyle, the man had ignored his orders to drop the hammer and began walking towards him, and that is when he fired two fatal shots. But Loku's neighbor and friend, Robin Hicks, who spoke out against the officer, told reporters a different story. The shooting fueled hundreds of Black Lives Matter protests in Canada, and those protests started again when the Special Investigations Unit announced that Doyle would not be charged in the shooting. Almost two years after the fatal shooting, Loku's death was ruled as a homicide. Not a criminal homicide where the killer is charged, but in a coroner's court, a homicide simply means that it was the death at the hands of another. A coroner's jury of five also released 39 recommendations, including improved police training and transparency. The activists who protested throughout the case's developments have promised to continue protests if the recommendations are not adhered to. His friends and family remember Loku as a community and a family man who would never even kill a bug. His neighbors have described him as kind, quiet, and ceaselessly helpful. He is now mourned by thousands of activists, family, friends, and community members, some who never knew him personally due to the protests in his name. In October 2020, a Welsh paramedic gave CPR to his wife after her sudden cardiac arrest. The off-duty paramedic saved his wife thanks to his life-saving CPR knowledge, which he urges everybody to learn. Hello, please, please, please. My dad's a paramedic, please. My mom is not breathing. Tell me exactly 
what's happened? I don't know. I'm lying in the bed and my mom has just come up. Okay, we're organising help for her. Stay on the line. I'll tell you exactly what to do next, okay? So just continue with them chest compressions over and over and tell them not to give up, okay? Come on, Mum. 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 Mummy, come on, you've got it. Just carry on with them chest compressions. This is going to give her the best chance, okay? Come you on, need to Mom. make sure that he continues with them chest compressions and keep reassuring him there, okay? Come on, Mum, you got it. Come on, Mum. And to keep going for me over and over and don't give up, okay? They are, they are. Are they there with you? Yeah, they are. Okay, I'll leave you with them, okay? Thank you so much. You're I'm welcome. Sorry. It's Thank all you. right. Don't apologise, okay? Take care. Thank you, Charles. Bye-bye. Phil Wilkins gave CPR to his wife, 48-year-old Ceres Wilkins, when she unexpectedly collapsed in their Pentrabach home. She had reportedly been saying goodnight to their two children when she collapsed on the upstairs landing. Hearing a sudden thud coming from upstairs, Phil hurried to see what had happened. The Wilkins family had spent the day of October 9th celebrating Ella's birthday with a small gathering in their garden. I'd been to say goodnight to the kids and had gone to get some ironing, Mrs. Wilkins later explained. The next thing I remember was being in the back of an ambulance, and Phil and the kids were looking at me upset. I still can't quite believe what happened, even now. The 50-year-old paramedic of 16 years gave chest compressions to his wife while his 18-year-old daughter, Ella, called 999 for help. Within six minutes, Phil's colleagues from the Welsh Ambulance Service arrived and delivered a shock with a defibrillator which restarted the school nurse's heart. As a teenager, Mrs. Wilkins was diagnosed with supraventricular tachycardia, a condition where the heart suddenly beats much faster than normal. Six years ago, she underwent a procedure called an ablation to fix the problem. Sarah was transported to the University Hospital of Wales in Cardiff, where she underwent the treatment her family responded to the ordeal by urging everyone they could to learn CPR. Ceres underwent treatment and was fitted with a pacemaker and defibrillator before she was discharged from the hospital. The family thanked the Welsh Ambulance Service and teams at the University Hospital for Wales for their care. Christchurch's Tristan Locke and his neighbor, Mark Cowling, had an ongoing and heated dispute over Locke's excessively loud music that he played for almost all hours of the day and night. One fatal night, Locke stabbed Cowling and called Triple One for help. Sir, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I'm not hanging up. 23 Gresford. Oh God, no, there's not the point. No, 23 Gresford Street, Christchurch. Spell the street name. <laughs> right now. Please, please stop kidding. No, it's serious. Can no, he's and breathing. Okay. No, okay. 23 Grisford Street, he's bleeding a lot. Okay, and the stabbing, is that correct? And cramp- yes! Are you with the patient now? I'm shouting because this is very serious. Are you with no. the patient now? No, very blah, 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 blah. Sir. No, it's you- not quite my fault. I'm a reasonable person. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hello, I'm right there. When did this happen? Right here, right now. Please, shut up. Here we go. Uh, I'm going to wait for the sirens now, please. What is your name? We'll wait for that. What is your name? Just get here. Get here. This is very serious. I need you to answer some questions so we get to the I'm not answering anything else right now without a lawyer. This is for the safety of our crew. Is the offender still here? This is for the lawyer purposes. We're going to sit here and wait. Just get here. He's alive. I'm not getting out of the house. If I let go of him right now, he's going to die. In September 2020, Mark Cowling had had enough. His neighbor, Tristan Locke, had his blaring music playing, and Cowling and his wife and nine-month-old child could not sleep. Cowling had reportedly tried all the possible channels to make the man turn his music down, from confronting him to reporting it to his landlord and filing noise complaints, but nothing helped. So, on the evening of September 5th, Cowling cut off the power supply to Locke's Edgewood home. When the power came back on, and so did the blaring music, Cowling turned it off again. 
By the third time, Locke had called his grandmother and texted his mother, both of whom he had a very close relationship with, one described by a psychiatrist as unhealthy, wanting to know what to do. Locke, autistic and suffering from an antisocial personality disorder, allegedly played music as well as video games to soothe him. Becoming more and more upset over his lack of power, Locke eventually went to Cowling to confront him. He had taken a kitchen knife with him and according to Locke, could not remember the actual stabbings. This claim underwent much skepticism in court by the jury and prosecution. He proceeded to break into the house, stab Cowling to death on Father's Day, and then contacted Triple One for help when he came to terms with what he had done. During his call, Cowling's partner shouted for him to leave, but he refused, stating that he would die if he lets go of Cowling. The out-of-work barman was found guilty of murdering his neighbor. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum sentence of 10 years without parole. When 40-year-old Katie Janess failed to come home from taking her dog on a walk one night in Atlanta, her girlfriend, Emma Clark, texted and called but got no reply. So she used the Find My iPhone app, which showed that Katie's phone, at least, was in Piedmont Park and not moving. Knowing that something must be wrong, Emma drove the usual routes that her partner would take. But there was no sign of them, and her location on the app hadn't moved. Growing even more concerned, Emma headed to the park. When she arrived, she saw their three-year-old pit bull lying lifeless on the ground. And then, not far away, she made the even more devastating discovery of Katie's mutilated body. Emma checked for a pulse, but couldn't find one. She fled the horrific scene, and at 1.11 a.m. on July 29th, 2021, she made the following call to 911. Atlanta 911, operator 7959. What's the address of your emergency? Sir, I'm at the entrance of Piedmont Park. I just was searching for my girlfriend's first because I couldn't find her. She said, she's here at Piedmont Park, please help. You said somebody's dead oh, at Piedmont God. Park? Yes, sir. Please help. Please. All right, yes, ma'am. I'm going to send help to you. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Where's she, at, where's she at in the park? She was away near the entrance. Like, I don't know how to explain it to me. Did you just see that? That's my girlfriend. What the Yes. All right, hold Please, oh my god, dude, it seems like she's dead, dead, like, it's so f All right, I'm about, to, I'm about to call Grady, okay? Please. Yes, ma'am, ma are you still on the line? Okay, I guess she must have disconnected. She said, uh... Atlanta Police Department arrived at the park's 10th Street entrance and secured the scene. Janice had been brutally murdered, and the crime scene was described as gruesome and hard to stomach. Officers searched the park and retrieved surveillance footage from neighboring businesses. There were increased patrols in the area the next day, but searches and inquiries led nowhere. Katie Janess had been in a relationship with Emma Clark for six years, and the couple considered themselves married. In grief, Clark posted online saying, Today I lost the love of my life and my baby boy. It was tragic. She was the most intelligent, kind, humble, and beautiful person I have ever known. I wanted to spend every second with her. He was the sweetest, most loyal companion. My heart is so very broken, my world will never be the same. Janess had planned to visit her mother in Michigan just a few days after her life was violently taken. Many were shocked by her death, which needs to be solved, and over one and a half thousand people donated money to help pay for her funeral. Katie strongly believed in equality and social justice, which adds to the injustice of her violent end. Piedmont Park is about two miles from downtown Atlanta, and at that time of the night, the streets were quiet. The last images of Katie were caught by a camera at the intersection of 10th Street and Piedmont Avenue. They show her walking Bowie across rainbow colors that had been painted for pride. This last image of Katie is especially profound as she was part of the LGBT community and was murdered not long after Pride Month. Other cameras captured six people in the area at the time of the murders. Atlanta police released the footage and made it clear that the people in it weren't suspects. As Katie and the dog were both stabbed multiple times, it's likely that someone might have heard screams or barking and possibly seen something that could help find the killer. On Sunday, August 1st, 
Friends, family, and members of the public gathered in Piedmont Park to hold a vigil for the woman, who her partner's father described as the most kind, gentle person in the world, and her loyal dog who died protecting her. Despite public appeals for information, and the police working around the clock, little progress was made on the case. In an August 3rd press conference, Atlanta Police Chief Bryant revealed that he had requested the assistance of the FBI, who can provide resources they don't have. The conference had been planned to focus on the pandemic and the COVID crime wave that had arisen in the city, but questions were asked about the unsolved murder. Police chiefs and the city's mayor expressed concerns about rumors that might hinder the investigation. Chief Bryant told the public, we need to make sure that the information going out to the public is accurate, adding that the police didn't need the distraction of misinformation. Mayor Lance Bottom said that there was no evidence to support the rumors of a serial killer or that the murder was a hate crime. Crime Stoppers Atlanta announced a $10,000 reward and police again asked for the public's assistance. Atlanta police are determined to bring the murder to justice and anyone with information on the case is asked to contact them or Crime Stoppers. For more True 911 calls, watch this episode next.